Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. The Caddo people represented the height of the original cultures here in what became Texas. To avoid problems with trespassing, you'll stay within your rights on a public river as long as you are floating on the water or walking on the bottom of the stream bed. These plant communities are literally thousands of years old and begin to form at the end of the last ice age. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, nearly $20 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Most of the state parks that we have in Texas are recreational parks. Very few of those are actually concentrating on archaeology. Cadoan Mound State Historic Site is unique in the fact that this park is one of the only ones that we have that does concentrate and interpret the archaeology and the Native American occupations of the site. So this is a, a relatively unique park. Cadoan Mound State Historic Site is a unique and interesting and significant part of our state park system. But it's also one of the most overlooked. A site this important really should have a lot more attention than what we do. The problem with Cadoan Mounds is its location. If you're traveling in East Texas, between Crockett and Alto, you can't miss it. Or maybe you can. This is one of the few straightaways on this highway, and so a lot of the people just pass right by. And of course, if they're going that fast, it's kind of hard to hit the brakes and turn around. To pass by Cadoan Mounds is to pass by an important part of Texas history. The Caddo Indians settled here along the Natchez River about 800 AD. They were an advanced society, divided into two distinct classes. The elite ruling class controlled the government and religious ceremonies, while the lower common class supplied the food and provided labor. The Caddos lived in round, beehive-shaped structures that could house as many as 40 people. They were known as mound builders, and that's what draws visitors to the site. This uh, site was a Cadoan ceremonial village. It encompasses three mounds, two of which were strictly ceremonial sites. The third was a burial site where burial ceremonies did take place. See that green stuff on it? What do you think that green copper. stuff is? It's copper. No. Over 150 Cadoan artifacts are on display in the museum. The pottery shards, flint blades, and ear spools represent the thousands of pieces of history that have been unearthed by archaeologists here at the site. This site has been one of the more intensively studied sites in the state. It's one of the best known archaeological sites in the state. Even now, we've got archaeologists here on the property who are working on it to try to find more information. Um, we've done a, a magnetometer survey of the site, and we found this structure. And here is the, an outside ring of, of posts with a central fire hearth and four interior roof support posts. 
There's little known about the, the Caddo Indians in general and specifically even less known about the early Caddoans that this site represents. The more we know about these folks, the better we are um, in explaining, learning about our history and going into the future with an awareness of who we are and what happened here before we were here. Despite the rich history of the area, finding a parking spot at Cadoan Mounds isn't a problem. Hi, how are y'all doing? Those who do stop in often get a little extra attention from the staff. Now that's a beautiful road down there. Have you driven down there? Yes, we went. We just took that little road down mm -hmm. and went down. We just went across. On those slow days where you get maybe one or two people that stop in, you know, normally those one or two people are just expecting a quick run through and what they get is, you know, the full history of the site, plus any extra information that happens to come up in conversation. Oh, we got the site of the replica house, is yeah. that what it was? Yeah. We lost that house. It was damaged in a storm about four months after it was built. So what I have it's a little bit isolated, in, we're out in the country, uh, but uh, one nice thing about it is that the people that come here want to be here, and so I very seldom have disinterested people walking in that front door. Here we go. One, two, three. Three is all I see, yeah. Even the folks who weren't really planning on stopping at Cadoan Mounds are usually surprised at what's here. In this place, we just we come across it because we saw a sign. It said, uh, Mounds six miles down the road, so here we come. And here we are. Yeah, if you get off the interstate, you'll be amazed at what you can see. I'll be darned. It's pretty neat. It looks higher than 20 foot, though. Working at a smaller park usually means a smaller staff. And a smaller staff usually means you do a little bit of everything. I process the daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly reports. Um, answer the phones. <laughs> Excuse me. And then uh, looks like a two inch deeper down. At the small parks, uh, you're a big fish in a small pond, so you do everything from correspondence to greeting the public, uh, school programs to cleaning the bathrooms, washing the windows, mowing the grass. You know, I just dug this out in the last hour, and well, it is soupy there. Things get old and need repair. Right now, we've got an inch and a half water line that had burst yesterday, and we're uh, attending to it. It just let go all of a sudden, I guess. It all comes with the job. Hi again. Hey, how are you? All right. Do we have two, two guys today or only one? We have two. Uh, Excellent. You break them up into two groups? I have already. OK, well, we'll. Springtime is field trip time, and Cadoan Mounds is a pretty popular destination for schools in the area. Here's a hatchet that was made uh, during that time period. Uh, there's a big ax out on the display table. We have some replica tools that the archeologists uh, constructed, and we usually do a hands-on demonstration with those. They're usually aware of weapons, and I like to show them tools. This is a piece of a deer jawbone fastened to a stick, and it's a grass cutter. Why do some of the women have like shirts on, but some of them don't? They didn't have cotton back then, or even like polyester. All they had was leather clothing. And in good old East Texas, 100 degree heat, 80% humidity, it um, gets a little warm. Some of them seem pretty bored or uninterested when they come in, but by the time they leave, they have a lot better understanding of the culture and the history of the park. And a lot of them are pretty excited. What happens to it? Anybody want to guess? People live longer. They live longer. What happens to your population? It, it, grows. Some, it grows. Right. So this would have been a thriving. Despite its remote location and small size, Cadoan Mound State Historic Site sits atop some of Texas' most unique history. It's a history that shouldn't be overlooked, even if you're in a hurry. Culturally, this is an important site. It's important to the people of Texas, and it's important interpreting uh, American culture. And 
the rest of the world needs to know about this. Come back and, and see what's really here. You'd be surprised. I will die for that which I firmly believe, for I know it is just and right. One life is a small price for a cause so great. As I fought, so shall I be willing to die. I will never forsake Texas and her cause. I am her son. The immortal words of Travis, Bowie, or another hero of the Alamo? No, these words weren't spoken here, but they were spoken by a Tejano patriot and defender of freedom who also made history in Texas. At the Casa Navarro State Historical Site, Jose Antonio Navarro's preserved 1850s home, visitors have the opportunity to learn more about this important early Texas leader. Jose Antonio Navarro lived through a period of Texas history when the very destiny of Texas was shaped and formed. He was born in 1795. When he was a young man, the revolution against Spain began, and there followed the governments under Spain, Mexico, the Republic of Texas, the state of Texas, the Confederate States, and then back into the United States. Yes, uh, we have and the only Spanish-speaking person present, appointed to the committee that wrote the state constitution. In addition, he was the first Tejano to write about the history of Texas. After Texas joined the Union, Navarro continued to serve his fellow Texans as a state senator, defending the rights of Tejanos and the freedom of all Texans. This part of town is significant. This is a historic part of town. It's hard to uh, realize that today. And it was here where basic elements of Mexican culture were being preserved. And Navarro deliberately chose to live over here in part because he was a, a man of Mexican culture. He spoke only Spanish, and he felt very comfortable among his, uh, his uh, neighbors here who, were, who shared his heritage and his language. When you walk in here, you see the, the patios where Jose Antonio Navarro walked, and you see the rooms where he ate and the rooms where he slept. Navarro retired to his native San Antonio, where he lived until his death in 1871. Casa Navarro represents our link to the past and our struggle for independence, freedom, and equality. Jose Antonio Navarro's home remains as a lasting reminder of his important contributions to our distinguished Texas heritage. For more information on Texas state parks and historic sites, visit our website or call 1-800-792-1112. We are at the Comal River in New Braunfels, Texas. It's a beautiful public river access site. Not all rivers in Texas, however, are public. To be public, rivers need to be navigable, and the general most common test for that is whether or not a river retains a width of 30 feet or greater from the mouth of the stream up. If you have doubts about whether or not a stream is public, we recommend that you contact a law enforcement agency and ask them if the stream has been considered as a private or a public stream in the past. Because Texas is 97% privately owned, much of the land that leads up to a public river is private property. People who recreate on, on Texas public rivers need to keep this in mind and understand that you're well within your rights to be on that public body of water as long as you're floating on the water or walking on the stream bed. Once you get out and up onto the banks, you may be trespassing. If you need information about accessing public rivers, we have a river guide website on our Texas Parks and Wildlife Department web pages. Users can go to this website and click on the river that they're interested in. The river will pop up. You can click 
on a particular access site and a picture will be shown about the access site. Some of the information shown will be uh, items such as is there a boat ramp, is there bait nearby, are there public restrooms, that type of information, or is it just a county road right of way with no improvements whatsoever. Another important part of this website is that it will show you how far away that access location is from the closest upstream and downstream location to help you plan river trips. Although this information may seem a bit daunting, we want you to understand that you need to respect private property rights when recreating on Texas public rivers. Up until the early 1800s, much of the Texas landscape was dominated by grasslands, expansive colonies of grasses and flowers that over thousands of years evolved into a thriving and balanced ecosystem. These prairies once fed the massive buffalo herds that roamed the American West. The extensive root system of these grasses stabilized and enriched the prairie soil soil that would one day become productive farmland. But today, these once plentiful ecosystems have all but disappeared. This little patch of native blackland prairie that we're at today is called Mocan Prairie. It's in Williamson County, just east of Round Rock, Texas. There's some effort to preserve this little prairie remnant, which is now surrounded by roads and subdivisions. Paul Montgomery has been photographing prairies and native grasses for over 10 years. When I first started photographing prairies, I was impressed by the fact that they were such small pieces of land that had never really been disturbed by development, and that really got my interest. What I was looking at was a habitat that had never been affected by us. The prairies began to disappear when the first plow hit the ground. New, more productive crops took over the landscape. Imported plants that provided a growing population with cotton and bread. Barbed wire was invented and the cattle empire expanded. The quiet biodiversity of the grasslands was rapidly replaced by armies of domesticated clones or devoured by livestock, now confined by fences. The tiny pieces of prairie that still exist have subsequently become oddities in their own land. The key to their survival lies with a group of people who are working to preserve and, in some cases, restore these remnants of our natural heritage. Well, I was, I was born in this little community of Floyd, which is just about a mile and a half from here. Uh, January 3rd, 1904, if you can put that on your computer, <laughs> and uh, played on this matter as a kid. And we boys would hunt rabbits and possums and polecats and what have you as a kid. I never had the least idea that I'd ever own this. This is an annual, annual species. Beautiful. They really are. As far as this med is concerned, I don't see anything but uh, just a perpetuation of the present situation since it's been here since the good Lord made this, this land and it's never had a stalk of Johnson grass or a cucklebur in it. I don't see that it'll be, uh, there'll be any changes in it in the next hundred years. And I'm very pleased to have that thought because It'll be so beneficial to future generations. Up until the early 1800s, the Blackland Prairie covered an estimated 12 million acres. Today, all that's left is a handful of scattered, unconnected remnants, totaling around 5,000 acres. Climber Meadow, just a few miles away from Matthews Prairie, is owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy of Texas. Well, these grasslands 
uh, lack the stature of old growth forests, they are as venerable as old growth forests. These plant communities are literally thousands of years old and begin to form at the end of the last ice age. And uh, there are certainly uh, some of these old big blue stem clones out here that may be a hundred or more years old. Many organizations, and certainly in Texas, the Nature Conservancy is, is doing everything possible to see that the remaining Blackland Prairie is preserved. It's not only the Nature Conservancy. Don't picture the Nature Conservancy as being involved in a single-handed crusade to save the Blackland Prairie. We're only part of the solution in this case. We work with a number of private landowners, uh, uh, everybody from ranchers uh, to farmers to, to absentee landowners, uh, to work with them uh, to help them to manage the remaining Blackland Prairie. The Reverend Tom Price owns land adjacent to Climber Meadow. He has been working with the Nature Conservancy to preserve his piece of the Blackland Prairie. There is so much evidence that we are not being very good stewards of the earth that we have. And so if I can make a contribution to preserving that, I'm glad to do it. We learn quite a bit about management from these people that have hayed these things for a hundred years or more, and hopefully they can learn a little bit from us as well. In any case, it, it's not going to happen unless we can have a partnership with a variety of property owners overall. We're at uh, Caprock Canyon State Park. Uh, what we're seeing here is a, a prairie restoration project that was started in 1980. Like the Blackland Prairie, little remains of the grasslands that once covered the Texas Panhandle. Lynn Pace, a resource specialist with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, is working to bring some of this habitat back. So what you see today, uh, since 1980, is a lot of the grasses that were seeded at that time have begun to establish and spread, and uh, you can see some diversity that, that has been created by that process. Uh, periodically, since that time, we have used uh, prescription burns to, to keep the, the mesquite and the junipers from coming back onto the prairie area. Along with prescribed burning, cattle have been introduced to the park as an additional management tool. Here, park personnel are learning to monitor the effects that controlled grazing is having on the grasses. In some ways, that sort of simulates the, the way the country was grazed back when the bison herds would come through periodically. <laughs> By using the livestock to simulate the, the grazing and using prescribed burning to simulate the wildfires, we can restore a couple of the processes that were uh, in effect when a lot of this grassland developed. I don't know that we'll ever obtain the diversity that was once here, but we do have a good start. Like the buffalo that once roamed the prairies, the grasslands of Texas are a symbol of our past, a reminder of what once was. Will these tiny remnants of the grasslands hold their ground? Perhaps the answer rests with the keepers of the prairie, guardians of what little is left of these once vast seas of grass. Next time on Texas Parks and Wildlife. The people that are selling their water rights versus the people that haven't sold their water rights, it's a fine line. That's when it's going to get messy. That's when people are really going to get tense. We have a B-25 on exhibit like was used in the Doolittle Raid on Japan. We're making a place where students 
and nature can come together and enjoy each other. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Sport, Fish, and Wildlife Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $20 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year.